Well, I mean, I feel, um, can you hear me? I feel really embarrassed now because I come bereft of gifts. I don't even have a crummy $400 picture of the boat race. <laughs> to offer you, all I have to offer you is my own good self, but I would like to say that it's a great pleasure for me to be here this afternoon, and uh, I'm very honored to be invited to this event. I'd like to thank Alex and Jeff and all the others who have invited me here. I'd also like to echo what Stefan said in his introduction, that is, I greatly admire all the work that people sitting here do. I think there's no doubt that, as Jeff indicated in his address, that social entrepreneurship has arrived and that it is a truly transformative phenomenon for the world. I think there is no doubt of the immense kind of wellsprings of energy which social entrepreneurship is producing across the world. Now, of course, um, the notion of social entrepreneurship is a controversial one, and there are many different um, definitions of it, and it, a bit, it is a bit elusive, but um, as I would use it anyway, as I would see it, it involves a number of qualities. One, a spirit of enterprise, a belief in you can do things, that just because they haven't been done before, that you can't do them now. Second, the spirit of ingenuity, lateral thinking. What was eBay? Well, it was something very different from probably anyone contemplated, in, including its founders, I imagine, when it was established. And third, I think, of, of a kind of um, values which go beyond the orthodox values of enterprise. To me, these distinguish social entrepreneurship both from the voluntary sector as such and from the sphere of business and the sphere of the state. And, you know, there are many people who, when they look at the contemporary world, um, they tend to think this is like a passive world in which we live, in which citizens have become passive in the face of, of world problems. But I've always thought the opposite, that this is a kind of reflective, active, energized world we live in. And for me, social entrepreneurship is an expression of that fact. Well, I'm not a social entrepreneur, but I become very interested in social entrepreneurship um, over the last little while um, since I've been working on a large project on the politics of climate change and the politics of energy um, security. And if you'll forgive me, I'm not going to talk about culture, but I'm going to talk about that project and also ask your advice about it because I think we need a deeper involvement of social entrepreneurs in all this than maybe we've had so far, although of course many people, many, many people are working on these issues. Um, I think the history of the debate about climate change is immensely interesting because um, when I first started um, thinking about it, writing about it, it was about 25 years ago, it was regarded as a, as a pretty marginal and remote concern for most people. Uh, you know, it was sort of the concern of like crazed environmentalists and then over, what, no more than three or four years, I suppose, you've got this fantastic switch around where the debate about climate change is everywhere, where you can't open a newspaper without reading about it and where the debate about climate change has become global. Myself, I'm not sure why that happened, but they say you learn something every day, and I've learned something today, that Jeff was the inspiration behind Al Gore's um, film, An Inconvenient Truth, and that's certainly one of the events that's helped propel climate change towards global consciousness. The other, I think, is simply really awareness of disaster. Hurricane Katrina may not have anything to do with climate change, but it showed you that a city in the richest country in the world could be reduced to ruin overnight. And then recently, most people here will know of a new prime minister in Australia, Kevin Rudd, who espoused environmental causes and uh, his advocacy of envi environmentalism and Australia joining Kyoto was at least one of the reasons why he triumphed in the election. Of course, Australia has immense problems with large areas of arid land, which seem to be becoming unproductive. You have other things too, like, for example, massive snowstorms in China um, quite recently, 
very, very unusual, both in the depth of the snowstorms and the parts of the countries which they, country which they reached. Whatever reason, there has been a massive switch, uh, clearly, in, in global consciousness of significance of climate change, and to that you, to some extent, bracket energy security too. Well, when I give these talks, I like to um, include one or two jokes, so I was looking for uh, climate change jokes. <laughs> But it might surprise you, well, it probably wouldn't surprise you to know that there are very few climate change jokes. <laughs> there are plenty of Al Gore jokes. <laughs> and uh, I'll come on to that a bit later at the risk of stepping on people's toes. But anyway, here, here are a couple of jokes that I found. I don't know whether you'll find them funny or not. There, there are, there, but I'd like you to laugh, obviously, even in you know, this <laughs> august lecture theatre. Um, there, there are a couple looking at their garden and the wife turns to the husband and says, George, the neighbour's fish has got in our garden again. Oh, you don't get it. It's because of, it's because of flooding. Flooding comes along with global warming. Flooding, right? <coughs> neighbour's fish has got in our garden again. I told you it was difficult to find climate change jokes. <laughs> well, what about the George Bush one? You might have heard it. I mean, George Bush has finally decided to take climate change seriously, and he's, he's got a project of sending 20,000 troops to the sun. <laughs> wow. That's a relief for us public speakers, but then George Bush jokes always get a laugh, even among Americans, so <laughs> I've found. Well, if you look at the state of the climate change debate, it's really, really interesting, because for several years, it was a debate between the skeptics about climate change and you might, what you might call the orthodox position, represented especially by the um, United Nations um, International Panel on Climate Change. The skeptics are fairly well represented. People who said climate change is not the result of human activity. Well, first of all, they said it's not happening, and then they said it's not the result of human activity. There are still people publishing books on this, quite important in the politics of climate change because if you don't feel like doing something about it, you can always say, oh, well, it's not proven, is it? Um, and against that, you had the position that climate change is serious. It is a problem facing all of us, but it is a fairly incremental thing. If you look at the, especially the earlier predic predictions and projections of the international panel on climate change, they were saying, look, we've got big problems 30 or 40 years down the line. But now, reflected to some degree in uh, Al Gore's um, film, um, you have a different school of thought, who I would call the climate change radicals. And I think you have to listen to them very carefully. They say that climate change is a much, much more um, urgent problem than before, than we thought before, than the orthodox consensus believes. And that it, it's, a, it's an issue that depends upon thresholds. So they say that you can get very radical forms of climate change happening very quickly. And they actually draw upon um, previous examples from the history of climate change, since the climate has always been changing, to show that you have very rapid shifts within a period of something like 10 years uh, of temperature occurring in the past. So this, they say, could happen again. And they argue that there are things going on in the world which could produce such threshold or events, or if you like that terminology, tipping points, which is sort of widely used in environmental literature. For example, take the Antarctic ice. It used to be thought that the Antarctic ice, since it's on land, is so solid that it will only melt um, slowly. But recent studies involving much more in-depth probes of the ice show that the ice could be splintering. As ice splinters, large chunks can break off and the whole thing might become unstable much more quickly than we imagine. We don't actually know, but it may do. And the same thing could be true for the, green, the ice on, on Greenland, the ice cap on Greenland. It could also be true of the escape of methane um, from the uh, peat bog in eastern Siberia. Methane is a vastly more powerful greenhouse gas than CO2. We just don't know exactly what is going on there. It's quite difficult to get access for Western scientists there. But many believe there's a really, really serious and imminent problem. So if you look at the literature, you conclude, I think, by thinking that these are risks we must take very seriously. 
we cannot any longer think that climate change is simply something for the future and that we can progressively build up an approach to it. It's much more likely to be something that's happening now, but also something which in the relatively near future could produce a threshold event which could cause enormous disasters across the world. So it's a much more horrifying scenario if these people are right than the one which has uh, been prevalent even among the orthodox scientific uh, community until relatively recently. If you want to read a really scary book by a scientific writer um, on climate change, you could try Fred Pierce, The Last Generation. He doesn't say we're the last generation on Earth. What he says uh, is that we're the last generation who will experience a stable climate. We've taken for granted a stable climate. Stable climates are actually unusual in, in climatic history. Uh, the next generation will enter a period of highly unstable climatic conditions. It is a pretty scary book, but it's written with, with a lot of scientific insight and information to back it up. So what do we do? Well, the response of the world community, to my mind, has not been nearly, nearly effective enough. Two main responses on the part of the world community. First of all, the introduction of carbon trading, carbon markets, um, which originated in the United States, then taken over by uh, the European Union, and the European Union has the world's biggest carbon trading market. So far, it's had almost zero effect, however, on reducing emissions. And there are many, many problems facing carbon trading markets. So anyone who thinks that's a magic bullet solution has to think again. Second, you have a kind of global architecture of agreement from Kyoto on to um, Bali and on to the so-called road back from Bali. But if you look at the negotiations involved there, Politics is everywhere in those negotiations, and I personally, I don't hold up much hope that these will produce the kind of radical innovations we need. So we need you social entrepreneurs in there, and of course, social entrepreneurs have produced a great deal of interesting projects in response. One could think, for example, of uh, the work of um, Reed Paget, the uh, social entrepreneur from Oregon, um, who developed the world's first completely biodegradable plastic bottle, uh, which he made a great success with, and he spent the profits on introducing um, water wells and uh, water mechanisms in India and um, parts of Africa as a result of that. And I believe uh, Mendy Lubbers is sitting here somewhere. I noticed looking back through older skull meetings that in 2006, I think it was, she got an award for her innovations trying to push uh, institutional investors and, and corporations to take more direct account of green issues in their accounting. However, the, we need lots of things like that, but I want to suggest, and I want to ask your advice really, that we need something I think much more profound than that. I would like to see if social entrepreneurs can help us resolve what I would take to be the three key problems of the politics of climate change. The politics of climate change for me is not about just reaching agreements, it's not about just saying, oh well, we'll invest in nuclear um, uh, energy or whatever. It's not about saying, oh well, markets will resolve these issues for us. It's about the how. We don't really have much of a how in relation to climate change. Countries have set themselves targets. You look at the climate change bill here, for example, in the UK, um, the climate change bill just going through Parliament, um, it, it's quite rigorous bill in one sense because it sets at least a 60% um, reduction target for 2050, and that would probably become an 80% reduction target. It has also other provisions in it, but there is no how in the bill. We don't really know how we're going to reach those ends. So the politics of the how needs an enormous amount of work. Well, the three issues I'd like to mention to you um, are the following. First of all, how do we cope with the fundamental and massively, massively pervasive issue in climate change politics of free riding? Free riding is everywhere in the politics of climate change. When you're talking about getting people to change their behavior, for example, to follow a, a more low-carbon lifestyle, 
It's not like asking people to give up smoking. If you ask people to give up smoking, that's a benefit which they will feel down the line themselves. In the case of uh, climate change and uh, policies regarding climate change, you have the problem that you want a collective outcome from individual solutions. That's a classical problem of political theory because you have many people, or you can have many people, who do nothing and who leave others to take the lead and to make the changes, but that's an unstable situation. So at the moment we have some nations free riding of others, with the most notable example being the United States free riding off more or less the whole of the rest of the world community, but all through the society you have individuals free riding of others. How do you tackle that phenomenon? Well, social entrepreneurs have done things which are relevant to it and um, if you've got any ideas, Jeff Skoll's got my card, you could send them to me. Uh, in Germany, for example, some people who were driving low energy cars um, started putting labels on their cars to show that they were low energy cars. That had the effect of shaming people who were driving the high consumption <coughs> vehicles. And that actually led to uh, a government scheme in some German cities whereby everyone who drives into the city has to have a sticker. So that if you're driving a Prius or something like that, then you get a nice little green sticker, but if you're driving an SUV, you have some glaring, horrible red sticker on your windscreen. And shaming mechanisms do seem one way in which we might be able to help control free riding issues. The second big issue in climate change politics, if you'll forgive me for this terminology, but we are in the Sheldonian theatre of the University of Oxford, what economists call hyperbolic discounting. Hyperbolic discounting means that, if I can put it very crudely, we find it very hard to take the future seriously. We find it very hard to react to an abstract future as compared to the exigencies of the moment. And economists have done all sorts of experiments to show how this works. So, for example, if you offer someone $50, well, in Jeff's case, have to be $5 billion in the, in the here and now, they're likely to take that $50 over as, as compared to, say, $300 um, four or five years down the line. It's not until you get somewhere much higher than you'd think, well over $500, that most people change the bargain, as it were. The economists think, and I think, that's because you've got two different selves involved, if you like. You've got your everyday self and you've got a future self which you find it hard to relate to. One of the reasons why people go on smoking, even though they know that it's very harmful, is the effects of smoking are in a distant, abstract future. If you're a 16-year-old girl and you started smoking to impress your mates, what do you care about what will happen to when you're 40? Because 40 is such a long way down the line. It's a very, very significant aspect of how people think. A very good way of thinking about it, sort of in reverse, is, um, and you might bear this in mind, is um, accepting invitations to go to conferences. <laughs> if you're asked to go to a conference, of course, you know, the Skoll, the Skoll conference you have to accept from this generalization, but if you're asked to go to a conference, um, you're much more likely to accept it if it's a year and a half away than if it's very close at hand. You think, oh yeah, someone's invited me over to Oxford, what a great idea. But what you should always ask yourself is, would I go to this conference if it were tomorrow? Because your, your time discounting and the fact that you're writing off the future much more when you accept uh, long distant invitations than when you accept an invitation coming very um, soon to hand. This is such a pervasive phenomenon of everyday experience and political thinking that we're all trying to work out ways of countering it. Well, one way of countering it, again, I think comes from social entrepreneurs. Uh, one way of countering it is to show that the risks involved exist in the here and now and bring that home to people to make the risk uh, real rather than it belonging to some remote future. One way of doing that is through vulnerability studies. And I believe that one of the things that social entrepreneurs should get involved with 
in many countries, and I, I'm afraid, especially in poorer countries, is vulnerability studies, which can go from local village communities upwards. Because we are all vulnerable to the impact of climate change. Once you discover how vulnerable you are, it certainly brings home to you the reality of the issue. But there may be other ways that I haven't thought of which this could happen. Third, the third big problem we have in the politics of climate change is, is uh, what some people call the, the law of increasing returns, which is about uh, energy saving or applies to lots of different things. You might think that it's a very good thing if people insulate their homes. You might think it's a very good thing if people drive their cars less. You might think it's a very good thing if people adopt certain kinds of um, carbon, low carbon lifestyles. But actually, when you look at the real politics of it, the situation is very much more uh, complex than that. Many studies show that if you increase energy efficiency, energy output increases rather than decreases. If you increase energy efficiency, the overall amount of energy that people use goes up rather than down. This can apply to an individual, and it can apply to a whole society. The reason is that if you make savings in one area of life, you have available resources to spend on other areas. So, for example, um, people in the, in the UK, unlike the US, you know, used to have quite small refrigerators. And uh, because refrigerators were a source of various kinds of environmental noxious influences, uh, the, the efficiency of re refrigerators was improved a great deal. What happened here? Well, people simply started buying these big American-style refrigerators. And they were actually consuming more electricity than before, even though the appliance was intrinsically more efficient than before. It's no good... Um, insulating your home if then you use the money to go on more foreign holidays, going on aeroplanes and thereby having environmental consequences. How do you deal with that? Because this is a really significant problem for tax incentives. If you have a tax incentive to help people insulate their home, you're wasting your money if they then use more energy than they did before. So you must have some way of getting around that issue. Again, we do have some interesting experiments that have been done by people who could describe as social entrepreneurs in the north of England who've got what they call sequential rewards. So instead of getting a tax-based reward if you insulate your house, you get credits which allow you to do more environmentally friendly things. And you can expand those credits in a sort of geometrical fashion so that you, you build a more environmental lifestyle without falling, uh, succumbing to the so-called law that I just mentioned. Well, in all of these areas and many others, I think, you know, we need lateral thinking, really. We need people like you to help us with these issues. Because my firm belief is we can't, if we can't resolve these three issues, and of course there are many others, we will not have an effective response to climate change. These are disturbingly significant in the everyday politics of climate change. And without answers to them, I don't think we'll be able to manage to respond adequately. So I would like to ask your involvement in all of this. And, well, I'd like to finish with an Al Gore joke. I don't know if that's allowed, but I was, you know, I was looking through all these joke books to try and find climate change jokes, and all you find are Al Gore jokes. Well, Al Gore, um, you know, won the Nobel Prize for this famous film, quite rightly, too. Amazing achievement, I must say. And, you know, Al Gore had a certain problem with the presidency of the United States because he won quite a lot of votes and didn't become president, actually. Well, the story is, Al Gore is sitting by the phone, and the guy phones him up and says, Al, you've got more votes than anyone else for the Nobel Prize. And Al Gore says, yeah, who won? Yeah. <laughs>